the average person's mind wanders 47% of the time, according to the 2010 Harvard study. So nearly half of your time that you're doing one thing, you're thinking about doing something else. So what do we do to disengage from distractions? Well, we might exercise. Allotting time for exercise is a proven way to improve focus, memory, and productivity. And, and we could check ourselves. You see, the state of the world is enough to fog anyone's brain. The reason we lose focus most of the time is because we are looking to escape from some kind of discomfort, such as stress, anxiety, loneliness, or boredom. But here, I already digress. I'm distracted by stats. We are supposed to be attending to the Word of God for us today. So let's turn the distraction into productive, productive insight. Since we are distracted by oddities, I have purposely set up a distraction. But let us use it instead of losing it. Okay? Because learning can come in many different ways. Our bus stop today is going to be occupied by two young people among us bringing John the Baptist's message right into our present day dilemmas of distraction. So I hope the way that I try to tie these together might make some sense to you. John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness. Sounds like an odd place to preach to me. Wild, empty space. John's clothes were made of camel's hair and he had a belt, a leather belt around his waist, apparently an odd thing at that time. His food was locusts and honey. That sounds a little bit strange as well. Out of the ordinary, especially to our modern day years. But he had a message. The people actually came out to hear and to respond to what he was there for. Wow, maybe we need to move our Sunday morning gathering into the wilderness somewhere. Who's up for it? No hands? Oh, honey, there we go. Well, John came to preach the coming of Jesus. The Christ, the one that was promised and the need to prepare for his coming by repenting, changing their lives, and being baptized. So what does that have to do for us today, or with us today? Well, we are distracted perhaps a little bit by the two young people among us. Sitting on a, park, on a, on a bus stop bench, Odd place for a bus stop, isn't it? In the middle of a church chancel. They're just hanging out at the bus stop, but I'm sure they are. You know, we might wonder, why, why are they loitering at the bus stop? What's going on with our young people these days? Hmm. Seems a little suspect, doesn't it? We could imagine all kinds of distractions and judgments about these young people, couldn't we? But most of them will probably have no basis for truth. That wouldn't be a very useful thing to do. So instead of using our distraction for judging others, let's try to exercise and a few exercises of identifying with others. Oh, that would be a different way of seeing who they are and what they're doing. Well, first, I would ask the congregation to identify with the faceless crowds. We heard about those in the story of John. 
who came up to be baptized by John, unknown, wandering out into the wilderness, listening and willing to listen to this odd duck preacher about changing their lives and getting ready to follow Jesus, this guy that hasn't even shown up yet. And they came by their own choice, and they were curious and willing to respond. So now, consider two anonymous young people at a bus stop. Maybe they just happen to be at the bus stop at the same time. Could be. Maybe they met there and have been invited to come to some place like, oh, maybe a church meeting to hear about how Jesus loves them. They weren't told to dress in a certain way, a fancy way to be acceptable. Just come as you are. I see them. I saw them looking at their phones. Hmm. Perhaps wasting time in the eyes of some who wonder what they were getting up to. But maybe they were looking looking up the best way to get to that church that they've been invited to. Curious about the big gathering as they are catching the bus to get there. Maybe it will be a life-changing event for them, or even for the ones who welcome them. So prepare to prepare for the coming of the Christ with repentance and confession of sins, we will be called to change our distracted and judgmental lives and be open to Christ's changing our lives for the good and for the good of others. Next, John recognized some of the religious leaders, it says, who were suspect to him. Why had they come all the way out into the wilderness you brood of vipers, he said, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Don't come out here with your traditions and proposed ideas of we have to do it your way. You will have to show change that turns your world upside down. In his address to the Pharisees and Sadducees, John announces the coming kingdom and the coming judgment of Jesus. The Christ. According to Matthew's Gospel, to meet and to know Christ is to be judged and saved all at the same time. How truly frightening and freeing this encounter is to all who will receive it. So I, I notice. I noticed our bus stop young people are up to something. They put on sunglasses. They must be trying to hide their identity. That's what it's got to be. You know, they're going to a religious gathering maybe, but they don't want to be known or identified yet. I guess perhaps sometimes it feels a little bit good to be anonymous until you Suss so, out so what's going on, what's unfolding at the event that they're going to. But is that why they're wearing glasses? Hmm. How about us? Are we welcoming? Do we cause hesitation or express a reluctant acceptance when we see young people coming into our service with glasses on, sunglasses, covering their identity? Who are they? Why are they here? Or are we able to exude a joyfulness to see them and make them feel at home? Do we offer trust in spite of those first impressions that we might come up with? These questions cause us to consider John the Baptist again. So we ask you, the congregation, to identify with John himself. Placing ourselves in the role of those who are to prepare the way for the coming of the Lord, 
the arrival of the saving judge who baptizes with fire and the Holy Spirit. In this case, we call the church, you, the people of God, and each individually, not only as a corporate body of the church, but as individuals, to take up a critical role toward the world, toward our particular society, and indeed toward our church. We call the church to speak words of judgment and work radically for justice so that all might know God's forgiving and providential care. That's what John did. That's what we're called to do as followers of Jesus Christ. As we heard the message from Scripture, the difficulty is not in identifying what is emphasized in the, in the text, but because what is emphasized is so piercingly clear. The problem is that what is emphasized is so hard to hear and to respond to appropriately. It demands our whole being, body, mind, and spirit to accept the birth, the ministry, the death, and the resurrection, which, comp which comprise an eschatological event, an eschatological event that means the church is already living and always will live in the turning of the ages. John the Baptist helps Matthew's readers see this nature of Jesus' ministry. Eschatology, it's a big word again. We don't like those big words in church. They just confuse us and confound us. Eschatology relates to the death, the judgment, and the final destiny of the soul and of all humankind. It's part of what we recognize in its fullness in Jesus Christ. But we don't like to. It demands something of us. For Matthew, salvation and judgment are two poles of the same magnet. Many of us like to preach or speak about justice, all the United Church has been great on that, hasn't it? Justice seekers. But avoid talking about the divine judgment. No, we don't want to go there. That just bothers people. If God decides between what is just and unjust, then God is the judge, not us. If God decides that we need to be saved from our sins because we don't understand even that we have sins and liberated from oppression, then God has judged our sinfulness and our situation as not lining up with God's will and purpose. God's mercy and love are meaningless if God cannot choose to see us and our situations in very different ways than we do. For Matthew, to meet and to know Christ is to be judged and saved at the same time. The proper response is repentance. The theological claim and the existential response is central to the season of Advent. Enough big words. What do we have to learn from our bus stop teachers here today? In light of this weighty message, I saw that they were sharing a granola bar. Sharing a granola bar at the bus stop. There's got to be something subversive about that, isn't there? I'm not sure what it is yet. We'll have to discover it somehow. But maybe, maybe they are expressing in a very simple act of the ministry of sharing care and kindness to one another. Perhaps they are preparing themselves to be working and living out that all-important role 
of witnessing in words and in actions. To care for each other and those that they will meet along the way, they must care for their own body, mind, and spirit so that they're ready to do God's will and purpose. To strive to be strong in joy and filled with peace. Oh, wouldn't that be amazing in this Advent season that we would all strive for that kind of peace, the simple sharing of nourishment with one another and all those that we meet. Hey guys, I think you must just came. Maybe our bus just came too. Today, we're going to celebrate the Feast of Communion. So let us join in this celebration of communion. This is a joyful feast of the people of God. They will come from east and west.